before we start, uh, as usual, I would like to introduce to our delegations our chairperson for the day, which is Professor Dr. Ahad Osman Ghani. Professor Dr. Ahad obtained a PhD degree in Human Resource Development and a Master degree in International Business from the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio, US. Currently, he is the Director of Graduate School of Management and a Senior Professor of Human Resource Development and International Management at the Department of Business Administration Faculty of Economics and Management Sciences of the IIUM, International Islamic University, Malaysia. During his academic career, Professor Ahad has developed many new and innovative courses in the areas of international and cross-cultural management, organizational behavior and change management, leadership development, human resource, and performance development. He was featured in the Harvard Business Reference of the Profiles in Business and Management and International Directory of Scholars and in Barron's Who's Who of the Asian Pacific Rim. Without further delay, I would pass the stage to Professor Dr. Ahad. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Distinguished uh, guests, panel members, speakers, my dear colleagues, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and good morning. I'm very privileged to be here today to chair the sessions and be among the scholars and the professionals who are thinking about the future of higher education in Malaysia. I think we are in a stage of the economic development of Malaysia where the emphasis on higher education, especially at the university level, is of utmost importance. Because when economy try to go towards the developed nation status, it is more significant, more important how you develop the human capital of the, of the nation. And the responsibility of developing human capital lies in the education sector, particularly at the higher level, that means at the university education level. I know there are a lot of challenges that uh, the educational institutions, especially the, the managers or the senior administrators of the uh, university and higher educational institutions are facing. They could be mentioned in different ways the academicians, academic issues, student issues, public sector, government issues, industry issues. I think during the, uh, yesterday and today, um, you must have, yesterday you must have deliberated on many issues, and today we'll be talking about few important issues, like internationalization, uh, the issues relevant to how to build the international image of an academic institution of a nation. Because when an academic institution of higher learning develops an international image, it creates an impact in globally, and then we, are, we can attract more talents to the educational institutions who in turn can produce more high quality talents for a nation, and that will be the engine of growth for the economic development. So I think your contributions, your deliberations for the whole day today on t three different sessions will be of significant importance, and it will lead to some significant outcome at least, if not all, that will help the economy to go more and move further toward the achieving of the status of a developed nation by the year 2020. With that, let me um, start uh, the session. First session, I think, uh, today is on internationalization and which will be moderated by Mr. U.K. Menon. Let me introduce the moderator first, and then I'll hand over the podium to the moderator. Mr. U.K. Menon is the CEO of Stanford College, one of the oldest higher education institutions in Malaysia. Beside that, he has held position as the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the, uh, in Strategy and Planning at the Wawasan Open University, Malaysia. He is a lecturer in law and Associate Director of the Asian Law Center at the University of Melbourne, and Senior Lecturer and Coordinator of the Law School in Mara Institute of Technology in Shalom. He has served on numerous committees of the Ministry of Higher Education and is currently a consultant to the Ministry's panel of the review of the private higher education legislation. So with that, may I invite Mr. Yuke Menon to come to the podium and take the responsibility of moderating this session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahad. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My role today is as a moderator of this next session on internationalization and its many manifestations in higher education. Um, I have some very interesting speakers, and I'm sure 
They would give you different perspectives of internationalization. May I invite all three uh, participants to come uh, on stage first before I do the introduction. Uh, Professor Anzari, Dr. Bina, and Professor Bergo. With your permission, I will retain the uh, order of, uh, of uh, speakers that is indicated in the program. Um, the first speaker will be Professor Abdulaziz Burgod Burgod. Professor Burgod serves as a full professor of Islamic studies and civilization, faculty of Islamic revealed knowledge and human sciences, International Islamic University, Malaysia. He holds a bachelor in finance, master in revealed knowledge, a postgraduate diploma in human sciences and doctor of philosophy in civilization studies. Professor Burgo lectured widely in international forums and conferences. He's widely invited as a keynote speaker in international conferences as well. He has received several awards, such as Best Lecturer Award, Best Researcher, Outstanding Research Award, and the Ajman Award for Excellence. Apart from this, he is selected as a consultant and advisor to several universities and organizations locally and internationally. The other two speakers who I'll introduce in detail as we get to their turn to speak are Dr. Bina from Curtin University in Miri and the very well-known Professor Dr. Anzari Ahmad, who I'll speak about later in the day. So ladies and gentlemen, without making any further introductory remarks on, inter on internationalization, I'm going to invite Dr. Burgo to make his presentation. And after the three presenters have completed their presentations, I shall invite a discussion from the floor. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm going to touch upon some aspects of internationalization. Uh, as you are all aware, uh, talking about internationalization actually is not only talking about the uh, maybe mobility or uh, movement of faculty and students from one place to another place or uh, maybe also when we talk about internationalization what comes to our mind uh, is maybe how we, uh, uh, how we uh, link ourselves to the rest of the institutions or the rest of the organizations of education. Actually, all these are the aspects of internationalization, but I wanted to go a little bit beyond that definition of internationalization when we talk about actually integrating an international aspect or component in our curriculum or in our research activities or in our community engagement activities. This is actually part and parcel of that process. But if you look at it really, uh, in the essence of the process of internationalization, you will see many other things. That's why uh, in these 10 minutes, I think, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes uh, let me just touch upon certain aspects of internationalization and then we can maybe discuss and debate together. Now, uh, talking about internationalization, we need to talk about global quality. It's very important if you really wanted to create an internationalization or efficient, effective internationalization process in your university or in your region, you need to think of quality. The global quality or the quality that you are actually producing, the quality that you are putting forward to attract the movement of ideas or people uh, or uh, uh, faculty members or students because people are not coming to you because you are just in this place or in that place. They are coming to you because they are very selective and they are looking for a quality. This is why the idea of internationalization has a link actually related to the type of a quality 
We put in our curriculum, we put in our research, we put in our processes, we put in our environment in the university and even outside the university. That's why I think this is the first important aspect of internationalization when we talk about internationalization and global quality means talking about standards. Whether in your education, in your model, in your, um, maybe f you have the, the best faculty members, you have the best student, you have the best processes, you have the best teaching uh, abilities, you have the best environment which actually attracts people. That's number one. Number two, when we talk about internationalization, we talk about what we call international stakeholders. International stakeholders means you are no longer uh, producing or introducing yourself into a very localized environment. You are dealing with demands which come from a different stakeholder where there are actually very uh, changing and dynamic demands. What do they want when they come to your university? This is number two. Number three, when we talk about internationalization, it is very important to talk or to uh, remember that it's in the end I don't want to use the term war, but it's actually a war for elites and talents. In the end, the question will be whether what you produce, is it actually making a difference or not? What kind of a graduate you produce? What kind of a research? What kind of products that you are, are, are the, these products, whether they are human people or research or innovation, are they actually meeting the international demands or not? This is why it's very important to understand that we are operating in a situation where we are talking about knowledge economy, we are talking about uh, economic intelligence, we are talking about all this new uh, type of uh, a learner which is looking for something that actually meets uh, his demands. That's why we, when we take this framework into consideration, we talk about internationalization as a process, as a process. And when you talk about uh, internationalization as a process, actually, it deals with uh, people, it deals with culture, it deals with mindset. It's not just that process of the mobility or the movement of uh, ideas or you have a KPI, you say uh, how many exchange programs, how many branches I, I uh, uh, establish outside, how many uh, people are coming to me, how many international conferences, how many uh, language courses I am producing. This is part of that one. But if you look at the essence of uh, internationalization, you have to see what kind of a culture you create in your institution. Whether it is engaging culture, inclusive culture, a culture which actually uh, can receive people from all cultures, from all backgrounds, and actually you can integrate them into a system. i give you an example. If we take International Islamic University in Malaysia, we have students from more than 115 countries from minorities, from the whole Muslim world. Uh, now, the question is, what type of a culture, policies of internationalization you create to engage all these differences and absorb actually the very many complexities of cultures and how you integrate them into your curriculum, into your policies, into the teaching, into the faculty, how you even train your faculty members to be able actually to provide that internationalization. That's why when we talk about internationalization as a process, we are talking about how we create those policies of internationalization which will be flexible and all-encompassing, inclusive, engaging, and how we create a culture into our university that actually can uh, uh, bring all these differences and create value and momentum from them, and how we create a brand what type of a brand actually we create? Now we produce, every university in the world produce student, undergraduates. But actually what makes a difference in your model? That's how internationalization starts. Means if I am just adding uh, the same graduates to what is existing, there will not be any difference. This is why uh, I think when we 
talk about issues of internationalization, the idea of uh, the type of uh, policies, culture, the, the model of the attributes of this graduate which we put forward are very important. The other thing about internationalization, because of the demands of the different stakeholders who come to us, we need actually to create a brand which integra integrates many demands, not only of our local setup, but what those students who are coming from Africa or Asia, or what they demand, what they need, and what they do. This is why, uh, for us, I think it is very important to uh, bear in mind that the internationalization is not only those KPIs that we always uh, put and link to one another, but it has something more than that to go to the mindsets, to the brands, to the strategies. I give you just the last example. For uh, Let's say if we take IIUM as an example for the strategies of internationalization, we actually uh, have a lot of uh, mechanisms in place to attract and as, as you are aware now, in the university we have more than 7,000 students coming from 115 countries to, act, to attract all those people. I think we need to do a lot of strategy. That's what we can do. The first thing we do, our curriculum actually, maybe like other universities, integrates not only the knowledge component, uh, but the skills. Let's say we teach the languages. For us, English language is a must. It's an entry requirement, and a student who cannot get 5.5 in TOEFL or six, band 6 in IELTS cannot go to his program. And that's actually, in uh, the course of time, proof that it's very important when you talk about a good quality graduate. That's number one. Number two, skills like creative thinking, uh, like uh, leadership, like management skills, all these are a must into the curriculum. Uh, of our uh, student. The last thing here, I give you example, even for the staff who are teaching international students, we actually provide them with not a diploma, but uh, we expose them to the skills, how they deal with the international student, the international cultures, and all other things. I think with this one, I thank you. Wassalamu alaikum. Thank you, Professor Bagur, for first of all keeping in, uh, in within the time limit. You took no more than 10 minutes, uh, th and also for sharing your experience with International Islamic University. And of course, as an international university, those experiences, of course, were very useful. Uh, provided a useful understanding of what we should do in a international educational environment. The next speaker for today is Dr. Bina. Uh, Dr. Bina is the Associate Professor and Dean of Teaching and Learning at Curtin University in Miri, Sarawak. Uh, she reports to the, to the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor and is responsible for strategic and academic leadership and continuous improvement in teaching and learning across all programs offered by Curtin in Sarawak. Uh, her doctoral degree is from Curtin University, Western Australia, and is in Applied Linguistics and Education. She's been a fellow of, of the Higher Education Research and Development Society of Australia since 2006. She won the 2006 Carrick Australian Award for University Teaching and the Curtin Ex Excellence in Teaching and Innovation Award in 2006. But more than that, I think Dr. Bina has done some important research into internationalization of education or into various aspects of internationalization and I'm sure she'll share some of her uh, research uh, findings in this uh, presentation of us. Dr. Bina. Thanks very much, Mr. Bannon. A very good morning to all of you distinguished uh, audience. It's my pleasure to be here this morning, and I hope I can share some of my experiences and my you know, knowledge about internationalization. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to engage with you today. And I'm just going to use some slides, so just give me a few minutes.
Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with some working definitions of what internationalization means. And it sounds very similar to what Professor Burgood has just told us. It's, it's, I mean, this is from Jane Knight, an academic from the United Kingdom, who's been doing a lot of research about internationalization for a very long time, since the 1980s. And she came up with this working definition of what internationalization means. And of course, it is a process of integrating processes of you know, multicultural, having adding multicultural, multinational dimensions to every process that takes place at the university. Um, and I mean, for Malaysia, I, I was reading some uh, references for internationalization in Malaysia. And some definitions include having an international faculty, having an international student population, having international curricula engaged, and engaging with the international community at large. I wanted to also share with you some trends in internationalization, what's been happening. Um, the landscape of international education has had dramatic changes in the last decade or so. And it was mostly driven by North America, um, with a huge exodus of students moving to North America and Europe for higher education. Uh, it's not so now. It's mostly driven by Asia. It's demand driven by Asia. And you can see that Asia, I mean, um, there has been a working paper in Australia uh, released last year with looking to Australia for the Asian century. They're calling 21st century and forward the Asian century. So Asia has arrived and it's going to be a very important game changer for higher education and internationalization. And we know the vision for Malaysia. Malaysia aims to get about 200,000 students by 2020, which is the vision by you know, the Department of um, Higher Education, Ministry of Education. And I think at the moment, Malaysia has a close to 100,000 students. So it's been a very successful um, place as a regional hub. And with policies, procedures, and quality assurances places in place, stakeholder confidence has increased dramatically. Um, I wa want to just talk about, a little bit about uh, what are some of the other driving forces. Student mobility. It's definitely a huge factor because the ability for the student to move and um, move degrees, uh, move into uh, jobs, that's been a huge appeal of international higher education. And of course, the, we've got the ranking, we've got the recognition. Um, internationalization of higher education has done a lot for more domestically um, educated, um, more with more value, the graduates having more knowledge to cope with global demands for their home countries. And of course, it's meeting the needs of emerging economies. Uh, internationalization of higher education has had to rebrand itself because it's no longer going, moving to the West to get an international higher education. Things have changed. I mean, if you look at the example of Malaysia, which I will do in a, in a short while, it's about strengthening research, it's about sharing expertise, it's about understanding perspectives of how phenomena, what phenomena is occurring in the world, and give understanding to your students. There's some aspects that I wanted to quickly move. I'm aware of time, so you know, I'm going to move very quickly, and we'll reserve uh, comments for later. Um, it's about quality and, and recognition. Internationalization of higher education brings with it the benefits of quality and recognition, and there is, it's undeniable that it doesn't happen. It's about access and equity. It's about financing and costs, yes, a major challenge. It's about bringing transnational higher education to build capacity. And it's, it's also about putting in place policies and procedures for these uh, internationalization to succeed. If you look at quality and recognition, there are lots of things that's going on. You can see that if you look at ranking requirements, that is a very major requirement for universities to move up in rank. They do have to have uh, internationalization factor. What are they doing to engage with the global community? What does their research look like? Do you work with partners, et cetera, and et cetera? 
Um, and it's also giving the students the ability to, you know, work in different countries. If you look at uh, Malaysian universities and looking at their professional accreditation, it's what it does for your students. It gives students the opportunity to work outside of your home countries. And this is a major draw for international students. So quality and recognition is a very important aspect of internationalization. If you look at access and equity, I think Malaysia can be a role model. I mean, it's, a, it's seen as a hugely successful country which has established international higher education. Uh, if you look at the cost, uh, it's much more expensive. Let's say, you know, I mean, we're from Curtin, and Curtin, it's much more expensive to study in Australia. It's three times as expensive to study in Australia. But if you look at international branch campuses in Malaysia, you can offer the quality education to students with a similar experience, if not equivalent, at one third of that cost. So it's about increasing access, it's about increasing equity of students to a high uh, you know, quality education system. I want to touch a little bit about how Malaysia has made this possible. Um, there has been a really good planning uh, happening in Malaysia to introduce internationalization to the general public or the general citizenship. In 1995, um, I'm just touching a little bit about history, most of you may be aware of this, 20% of Malaysian students studying abroad had led to about US 800 million flowing out of the country. And during that time, only 7.2% of Malaysian students were studying in local universities. And this is you know, quite, quite a surprise if you look at what's happening now. So partnerships with higher education providers started during the seventh Malaysia plan to reverse this trend and also with the vision to make Malaysia a regional international higher education hub. And in 1996, the Private Higher Education Act paved the way for more international branch campuses to set a brick and mortar universities here, not just by distant or online or anything, but with a huge presence which required huge commitment financially from these foreign universities. They had to bring faculty, they had to actually have a physical presence in Malaysia. And of course, all the transnational branch campuses in Malaysia are subjected to quality assurance processes in their home countries as well as that of Malaysia. So I think that increases stakeholder confidence. There's some examples and you know what they are. I think there's more to come from yesterday. I'm just going to skip with that. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to build uh, undergrad capabilities about internationalization. I mean, what does it do to the individual? One, having a case, I mean, d regardless of the discipline the student is engaging in or studying, bringing case studies that encompasses that of Malaysia, that of Australia, that of the United Kingdom, or any other country that's bringing their education here, and having this international curricula actually helps the student to think beyond their shows. It helps to understand what the demands of the global community will be. It's about preparing the students for an unknown future. It's, it's about building knowledge, competencies, and anal analytical skills to students to engage with the community at large. I just want to touch a little bit about what is Curtin, I mean, what does Curtin do? We have an expectation for our uh, graduates. We believe or we want that our graduates will come out of the university with nine graduate capabilities. And uh, we work, all of these graduate capabilities are embedded in every unit in a course. That means every learning activity and every assessment will actually measure whether these capabilities have actually been developed in the student at the time of completion of study. And Curtin also went with a very ambitious plan in 2020, 2010 with a project called Curriculum 2010 introducing a triple I curriculum in every course that the, the university was offering to its students. It was about having industry engagement, it was about having indigenous, that means contextualized um, case-based studies embedded in the curriculum, and it's also about interdisciplinary knowledge so that the student has an idea of what it is to work with businesses, to work with you know, engineers and so on. 
Well, it's not so easy. I mean, having said that, there are lots of challenges for internationalization of higher education, I mean, bringing it. You need a lot of support systems in place to help the student cope with the transitions that's required. If they are domestic students, regardless of whether they're domestic students or international students. So we have a system like, you know, we've got like a, a focused dean for teaching and learning, which I fulfill. We work with school deans. We've got campus services, uh, international office to help students, and we've got uh, school uh, faculty with international small units. And of course, the content has to be very carefully developed. It has to reflect relevance. It has to be current. It has to have critical perspectives about why world phenomena occurs. And we engage with international faculty. I mean, they bring in lots of experience. And these experiences and research experiences are shared with students while engaging with them. Finally, I just want to talk a little bit about this project that I'm engaged in. It's called the Learning Without Borders Project, and it's an Australian teaching and learning uh, funded project. We are working with um, other universities, not just Curtin. I'm working with Swinburne in Melbourne and Swinburne in Coochie. Um, and what we wanted to find out from this, you know, you can, you can see the research. We've got uh, four people, and they're all in different campuses. In, um, fortunately for me, Swinburne happens to be in Coochie, so it's quite easy to engage with them. Um, what we try to find out is how do we reward, reward and recognize staff who are engaged in transnational higher education. The, some of the aspects we try to identify is to look at institutional policies and practices and what sort of professional development is in there in place for staff to cope with international higher education. What are some of the staff experiences in these roles? And what is the staff's preferences for internationalization? What we found is that there are lots of issues. There is a need. It's, um, you know, it's not so easy working in Malaysia while your unit coordinator is located in Australia. So there can be issues. There's, it's competing with your time for research. Um, it's also having how do you ensure equivalence. Um, there's English language competency issues, uh, moderation issues, etc. We came up with this model, which I'm going to go, and I'm going to move to conclusion. I know that. All right. So what has internationalization done for higher education? It is establishing competition. It gives you the opportunity to collaborate with partners. Um, you can see that Australia and the United States are moving into a very deeper internationalization uh, program, which is very leading to the core of all their curricula. And we can see that Asia is going to be a huge player in the next coming decade, and uh, with Malaysia, Singapore, and Middle East vying for international students. With that, I'd like to end my session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bina, for that. Um, it's, it's, you know, probably it's not an accident, maybe. Ira Ibrahim had a hand in organizing this. But we have three, the, the three speakers rep, uh, re, uh, represent uh, very three interesting manifestations of internationalization. Uh, Islamic University, you know, an old establishment in this country in relative terms, uh, brought in students from a whole different uh, uh, environment into this country, used Islamic uh, knowledge as its found as its foundation uh, uh, process, uh, and created an international uh, uh, enclave within the educational landscape before we actually saw the growth of internationalization in this country. Um, Dr. Bina's approach from a foreign university, establishing a campus in uh, Miri, uh, discussing about what kind of uh, imports such a university could bring into the educational la uh, landscape is also interesting. Uh, but both, both, those, both these institutions, although I think the Islamic University is not a foreign institution, it is very much a Malaysian institution, it is about what internationalization has done to us. The next speaker, Dr. Ansari, uh, comes from an entirely different uh, uh, position. 
he is a Malaysian educational entrepreneur, if I may use the term, because others have used this before me, who is doing to others what others are doing to us in international education. And in fact, uh, I won't go through the, the detailed uh, biography of his here, but what he has done really is that he has taken the Asia E University, which is really a collaboration of several nations in the country, established a distance education center in Malaysia and is broadcasting or beaming out education from Malaysia into all these other countries. I know that he's already had tremendous success in India. He's got great followings in the uh, neighboring countries. And it'll be interesting to hear from Dr. Ansari a slightly different and probably, you know, in, in, in a sense, an interesting vision of what a Malaysian from Malaysia looks at international education. There is still a fourth element which we have not discussed, but I'll come to that later. I'm sure Dr. Ansari would talk about his experience in establishing the Asia E University as an international university functioning from Kuala Lumpur. Dr. Ansari. Thank you, Chairman. I hope you didn't give a big hype and expect something really serious from me. Let me just get this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And a very good morning to all. Uh, it's always the third because it allows me to actually cover areas in which the other two have not covered and skip over things that they have covered that I don't have to have to cover. And thank you very much again, Chairman, for the kind introduction. Now, we are in a digital economy. And uh, as you know, that we're also in a globalized uh, economy. And it's a huge demand because we're in this knowledge economy for education and a very critical factor which is becoming more and more important, which is lifelong learning. We are now talking of learning from cradle to grave and we cannot run away from that. So I'm just going to go very fast what the higher education landscape uh, is like. This I got from a recent report uh, given by Ken Research, which only came out this year, talking about the global education market size, which is about 3.8 uh, billion right now. And it's predicted to go by 2020 to around 6 billion. So it's going to go that, that's the kind of size that it's going to develop to. Now, Brandon Burke said this in 2008, that in this next quarter century, we're making higher education one of the most active sectors of the global economy. It is growing at about 5.5% overall. And in terms of distance education, it's growing at 34% per annum. So you can see the difference between conventional learning and distance education learning. It's about six times greater. Total number of uh, what you call tertiary enrollments is 40% higher than it was seven years ago. So more and more people are going back to, to university for education. We have passed 101 million students in 2006, and now we have 164 million students studying internationally uh, throughout, the, throughout the world. In 2007, about 3 million students are studying outside the country, and it's predicted to, to double in 2012. Now, global demand for international higher education is going at 5.5 per annum, globally. This represents about four times the global demand in 2000. Uh, in the year 2000. Now, where are the foreign students right now? This is uh, the best result I can get in 2009. Globally, about 3.3. In North America, as you can see, almost half of them, more than 50% of them are in North America. Now, the interesting figure that you need to see here is East Asia and the Pacific, 680 million or so. And look at right at the bottom there, South and West Asia, 15.4 million. So we are up and coming in terms of a destination for, for higher education internationally. Now, who are these learners? Most of them are people who could not attain and go to universities before. They see pass going to higher education as a passport to improve their livelihoods. And the second group, an increasing group, is other lifelong learners who are, coming, who are coming through. Who are the major players in terms of internationalization? As you mentioned just now, US, UK, and Australia. These are the big three. All right? Between US, UK, and Australia, they, they, they conquer about 70% of the total international market. Middle players, Germany and France, are becoming more and more important in terms of higher education, because education there is cheaper than going to US and going to UK or Australia. Now, evolving destinations, Japan, Canada, and New Zealand are beginning to also become more and more aggressive in terms of getting international market scale. And emerging contenders is what we say, Malaysia, Singapore, and China. And you'll be surprised, right now, China has 280 over 1,000 foreign students studying in China. Malaysia only has about, about 95,000 at, at the moment. So China is attracting more and more. And more and more of the students are coming basically from the Western world rather from, uh, from, from Asia itself. Now, Malaysia is a global provider in terms of education. 
2010, we are approximately about 95,000, uh, 94, 95,000 around there. This only represents about 2.5 percent. Even if you look at the at the, at the target of around 200,000 students by 2020, by 2020, the international student what you call population is going to go to about seven to eight million. So it's still a very small percentage. Actually, in percentage terms, we are going down from the 2.5 percent. It's much smaller than what it is. So it's not, in terms of actual numbers, it may be bigger, but market size is, is shrinking because it's becoming more and more competitive. I'm not going to go through every single one of these main points, but these are the points that come out when you ask international students, why is Malaysia an attractive destination for, for what they call uh, for international students? Now, I'm going to go very quickly in terms of modes of a global education provider. What we are, sorry, what we are very familiar with is, uh, is consumption abroad. We, we basically, this basically gets GET has come out with this, uh, what they call, four modes of developing uh, programs internationally. What you're most, what they call, familiar with, and most of you in this room are familiar with, is mode two, where the consumer, the student, comes to our country, studies here, you know, uh, abroad. This is mode two. What I'm going to spend more time talking to you about is mode one. But before I go to mode one, mode three is where something like Swinburne, you know, you go and set up a foreign campus. So, for example, MMU has got a small little campus uh, Africa, Limcock Wing has got overseas branch campus as well. Kind of thing. So this is mode three, which is also growing, and I think more and more of our our local universities should be thinking of mode three, setting up branch campuses overseas if you want to become a serious international player. But I'm in the business in mode one, which is basically the consumer doesn't have to come here, but we take our programs cross border overseas. The other player here is an old friend of mine from Open University. They are here as well, in which we take education uh, overseas, kind of thing. Now, I'm going to talk about this point in terms of online distance education as a rebranding and why it's the best option for most of the people in this room who are conventional. Why, do I, why am I saying this and trying to be uh, different? Because most of the international players in the world and even some of the top universities in the world are also on this game now. They've already jumped on this bandwagon and they're doing the same thing. You can see big names here, Oxford, you can see MIT, you can see Harvard, etc. They're all playing the same game already. So if you are not in the game, you are being left out as far as internationalization of higher education, cross-border provision of higher education kind of thing. Why is this happening? Because now we're dealing with digital nations. Mark Prency, a famous educationist, said this. Today's students are no longer the people of the education system as were designed to teach. If you're still talking of chalk and talk, you're still talking of seminar rooms, you're still talking of lecture rooms, you're outdated. You're behind time already. Because your students now are digital. They're everywhere. They want to be sitting in a Starbucks and studying at the same time with the other groups etc kind of thing. They want to be using their smartphones, they want to be using their iPods etc. So they have grown up with other things, with other instruments and other tools and therefore we as educationists are we using those tools uh, or not. Because our students are increasingly digital, they want instant access to education and knowledge kind of thing, they're constantly connected and they're globally connected, they want anytime, any place uh, and personalized kind of uh, approach to their, to their learning, they know no boundaries uh, whatsoever, they can communicate across culture, time and distance, there's no problem for, the, for our clients. So are we serving our present clients or not? Are we going to serve our future clients for this kind of clients? because we've been serving the old kinds of clients, and what these new clients are looking for is highly customized experiences. So something different from what we've all been used to. We've been using, we've been using the mass education model, all of us. Uh, Peter Senge says it very well. We've been using the industrial education model, and we are now looking at clients who want things to be very personalized, no more the industrial mass education badging. You know, you know in terms of uh, chemical engineering, you talk about bad, batching. Uh, you batch, you know, uh, each, uh, each fermentation process. So we are in that kind of batching industrial kind of model, so we have to move away from that. Another important thing is that our students now are highly socially connected. And that social media is another media that people are using now in terms of education, in terms of communication, in terms of doing business, etc., and all that kind of thing. So I'm going to spend a, one or two minutes on this new phenomenon, a tsunami which is taking place in the higher education sector, which is called Massive Open Online Courses. All right. I and mean, before this, I'm sure you've heard of MIT Open Course. That was the precursor to the MOOCs, but the MOOCs have become so big. And now, one of the things that's happening now is Coursera. Now, Coursera is a very interesting, what they call, model, because they've got currently 33 universities already offering 200-plus courses with them. And the local, in our region, the one who's active in Coursera is NUS. There's no Malaysian university active in Coursera as yet, as far as MOOCs are concerned. But you know, MIT and Harvard came out with the edX. Uda City actually is the, the, is the precursor to all this, which came out from the University of Manitoba. And now they are offering courses now, open, online, and free. 
Meaning that today, your students in your campus, in IIU campus or UTM campus or UTP campus or whatever campus kind of thing, they can take a similar kind of course from a top professor free from another part of the world. And they can compare that curriculum to your curriculum and see whether your curriculum is up to the mark or not up to the mark. The only difference is assessment. All right? So what what is happening today is as a university, your credentialing is the one that's just, just different from the other universities' credentialing. That's the only difference kind of thing. So when you talk about internationalization, they are actually just a click away. These top universities are just a click away from your students who are in your campus experiencing a campus experience in your campus. Now, so what do we do? So this is what we call, so MOOC is considered a game changer. All right? So this game changing is going to have a huge impact on us as conventional universities working in the same space. Whether we like it or not, they are there. So we have the old university paradigm, which we are all very familiar with. We are entering to this new paradigm of higher education. I don't call it a new university paradigm, but it's a new paradigm for higher education, in which you can take a course from anywhere in the world from another university. All you need now is to pay a specific fee to get a badge. So badging is a new phenomenon which is taking place. So in the future, as employers, you may be looking for a student with multiple badges rather than a single badge from one university. That's what's going to happen in the future. So the key advantage as a conventional university, if you move into this space in terms of rebranding yourself, there are so many different advantages that you bring to you as far as your brand experience is concerned. Your present brand experience is what the student is experiencing in campus. But this allows a brand experience which is in and off campus, both in and off campus uh, brand experience, and allows you to also, for you, to become a cross-border provider, for you to become a global player. I'm not going to go to every single one because I do not have the time. So this new MOOCs model is called a disruptive business model. It's going to disrupt the way we do business in terms of higher education. Sorry I'm using the term business because I know some of us are, belong to the public sector here, but educa higher education today is a business, it's a commodity whether we like it uh, or not, kind of thing. Now what are the key issues if you're talking of rebranding yourself and moving into this new space and becoming a global provider in terms of internationalization? I'm not going to go through every single one uh, of them, but we have got human resource issues, you have technology issues, you have assessment issues, you have curriculum issues, you have what you call uh, intellectual property issues, accreditation issues. I can, I can tell you horror stories of how to get yourself accredited cross-border because you know, at the moment you are functioning in about 18, 24 different countries or 32. Every country have got their own regulatory powers, their own accreditation process. So, so to get recognition is easy, but the accreditation is a totally different uh, ball game. And very important what you call aspect as well is maintaining the university. If you're a university, maintaining your university community, both in campus and off campus. How do you maintain this community and how do you develop this international uh, community kind of thing? Another important factor is the language barrier because most of us think that English is the biggest and most important language. But actually, the, if, if, you, if you look at statistics, the one that is spoken most in the world is Mandarin and not English. English actually is, you know, is a small, in terms of numbers of speakers, is small compared to Mandarin. So if China is going to become the global superpower in the next 10 years or so, is Mandarin not going to be a very important language? So that's something for us to consider uh, as well. Competition. Now, the strange thing is that as universities, for the first time, we're seeing competition from non-university providers who can provide these badges, and therefore they're going to have inter accreditation bodies, et cetera, kind of thing to address this, uh, these issues. Of course, the rules of engagement have got to change because we're not talking of global rules of engagement, and of course, we're talking of having a transparent quality assurance regulatory process without, without fail. Enough, and we have to address all these issues if we want to get into this, uh, this new space. So I hope I've given you another perspective, internationalization, saying that you know, whether you like or you don't like it, as a commercial university, you are in competition with these borderless providers. And how do we face this competition? Key today that we have to, uh, we have to ask ourselves. So thank you very much for your attention.